right. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Good to see everybody. Uh, so we are continuing our series that we started earlier this month called I Asked for Wonder, like Matt said. And what we've been doing with the series is we've been sort of looking at what are the ways that perhaps we can engage something divine and holy and beautiful in ways that can't necessarily be, be charted in a spreadsheet or a pie chart or other, other things that you can just basically like put your fingers on. And, and we talked uh, in the first week, we talked about sort of the kind of the movements the kind of the movement through human consciousness of post or pre-rational, rational, and post-rational, and how what we're trying to figure out is how do we live in a world where we can have ha have a relationship with things like facts and data and science and medicine, but also have sort of room in our hearts and in our in our minds for things that we don't fully understand, like prayer and just all sorts of other uh, other things that perhaps connect us to things that we that are just a little bit beyond what we can like put a full like like concrete description to. So we're going to continue that today. And um, as we get started, I'm going to tell, I'm, I'm about to tell a story and I'm just going to go ahead and say, I've told this story before. It was a long time ago when I first, uh, I think maybe the, like the very first time I ever preached here. So I'm going to tell it again. If you were here that day, feel free to go ahead and start working on your grocery list on your phone and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be to the new content in a few minutes. But um, anyway, so I, uh, a long time ago, I was a teaching pastor at a pretty large church. Uh, near Fort Worth. And um, and when you're a teaching pastor at a large church, basically what that means is you're kind of the understudy for the main guy that everybody's really there to show up to see. And um, and so nobody's really that happy when you're preaching, but you're, it's your job. And so it was, it was a job I had while I was in seminary. And uh, it was, you know, it was, it was good work while I had it. And so I was, I was doing that as, as my job. And, um, and it is, it is a common occurrence that if you're a teaching pastor, that when, when people see you and they realize that you're there to preach that day, a look of disappointment will fall over their face and they can't hide it. And, um, and so I remember there was one night, it was a Saturday night service, a big church. And so it was a Saturday night service and I am standing out, um, like right outside the, the main doors of the auditorium. I'm standing with like one of the greeters, this guy named Bryce. And he and I were standing there together and we're just greeting people as they're coming in. And I'm wearing this basically, the only way I know how to describe it is like basically the Britney Spears, Garth Brooks uh, style of like headset mic and uh, that's on my face. And, um, and which basically is the way that everybody knows like, oh, that person is preaching today because they have the giant microphone on their face. And so I'm standing outside and I'm wearing the microphone and this woman comes over to me and she, she walks through the front door and she walks straight to me and she like points at the microphone on my face and she says, are you preaching? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, you know, like, congratulations. You know what I mean? I don't know what, I don't know how to say it. Like, yes, I am, I guess. And so I think, I think I am. And so she said, um, she said, ugh. <laughs> she said, I was really wanting it to be, and she said the name of the, the senior pastor, and she, was, she said, I was really hoping it would be him tonight, and I don't know, like, what am I going to do? Like, okay, well, I'll call him and tell him to come back from vacation because you're bummed, but um, so I, I, and so I said, I said, well, you know, I'm trying to keep a, you know, I, and so I said, I said, oh, well, you know, he'll be back next week, so, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll have some fun tonight anyway, and so, and she goes, oh, fine. And so she turns around, walks out the building, gets in her car and drives away. Like she does not even stay. And so Bryce looks at me and he said, how's that, how's that working on your self-esteem? And I said, uh, and I said, it's not great. And he said, well, he, he said, the good news is she won't be here to leave you a mean comment card afterward. So you've got that going for you. I said, that's a good point. So in fact, while I was still at that same church, there was an older guy who also was on staff with me and he was, um, he, he was sort of like in a mentor role with me. And so he and I went to lunch one day and we were sort of talking about, he was kind of helping me sort of um, kind of figure out how to do this better. And when one of the things he said was, he said, you know, Rob, he said, your preaching style, it's a lot like blue cheese. And I said, you're going to have to say more, Charles. And, um, and, and he said, he said, here's what I mean by that. He said, everyone who hears you preach has a strong opinion on it. He said, either like nobody nobody's medium on blue cheese everybody either loves blue cheese or blue cheese is the worst thing they've ever tasted and there is no middle and i said that's a fair point he said that's a lot how people respond to your preaching i was like that's great thank you so um he said and i was like where do you fall on that charles and he was like i'm medium so i'm just um, so anyway, so basically all that to say, like, yeah, th this, is a, this is a thing that happens in any church where there's more than one voice in the room, which is like some people prefer one voice while other people prefer another. And this is not new at all. And this can happen for any number of reasons. A lot of times it's just personality, style, sense of humor, whatever. Um, but, but there's any number of reasons why somebody might respond to one voice over another. And, um, and, and I in fact, while I was, uh, while I was doing this, 
in the last service. I was going to tell you. While I was doing this in the last service, this couple got up and left. And, um, and I was like, I get it. I, I prefer Ashley also. So, um, but what are you going to do? So anyway, so again, this is not new. But uh, in fact, we're going to, so we're, in a second, we're going to look at uh, a passage from the book of 1 Corinthians. And what's going on in 1 Corinthians, you, you have exactly the same kind of tension, which is you have this church. You have this like early first century church that has very recently been established. And they're trying to figure out for the first time in history, how do we do this? How do we, how do we create and, and have a church that, that is healthy and thriving that is, a, that is oriented towards following the way of Jesus? Because at this point in history, no one's ever done that before. And so we're trying to figure this out. And so you have this guy, Paul, who has helped establish this church, and he's writing letters back and forth to this group of people. And he's trying to breathe some amount of insight and wisdom into what they're going through and the tensions that they're feeling. And at a certain point, Paul begins to acknowledge that, look, I realize there are multiple voices in the room, and there are some of you who prefer some, like certain voices, and others of you who prefer different voices. So Paul starts making this, art. so basically, okay, so what's going on here is you have, a, a, the, the voices are these, like, so first of all, you have Paul himself, and he's acknowledging, like, yeah, some of you, because I was one of the guys who started this church, you're going to sort of uh, favor my voice over other people because, like, I'm I'm probably in likely in all likelihood one of the people who brought you into this whole thing. So it's possible there's going to be a certain amount of like, yeah, when Paul's here and when he's the one who's talking, that's who I really like want to hear from. But then there was also this guy named Apollos, and for from different various sources, it seems like Apollos was a really compelling storyteller. It seems like he was he just had a very strong. Uh, personality and, and was and was really compelling when, when when he would speak and so there were certain people who would say things like I I prefer Apollos I am of Apollos is how they would maybe say it and then you also have another voice in the room who would sometimes speak which was a guy named Cephas or uh, Peter is how uh, is is how we probably know him uh, but Paul refers to him as Cephas in this letter but what he's talking about is Peter, like one of Jesus's original disciples. And so, of course, you have people who are saying, well, Peter knew Jesus in real life. So we probably ought to give more credence to what Peter has to say than the other two guys. So when the other two guys are talking, we can maybe dial it or maybe we can tune out. Maybe we can just sort of not really be that interested, maybe not take it so seriously because, well, you know, these other guys didn't know Jesus as well as Peter did. And so, so you have these different factions rising up inside this church based on who people prefer to listen to. So again, not a new occurrence at all in the church. So Paul starts making this argument. And basically Paul says, if everyone chooses which voice that they're going to take seriously, and then they disregard the other voices, you begin to miss all of the dynamic, interesting things that come from hearing from different people. Because as it turns out, if you only listen to one person, then you're going to miss all of the insight that's going to come from the other people that you aren't listening to. You are going to miss all kinds of wisdom and insight and, yes, wonder if all you're listening for is one single voice. So Paul gets into this argument, and he's saying, listen, this is a problem. And it's not just because you're expressing a preference. It's because you are, you are devaluing points of view that actually might help you experience new points of interest and wonder. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, uh, Paul writes this. He says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. And when he says worldly, what he's talking about there is he's saying, look, there, there, is, a, there is a posture and a point of view that's a little bit immature here. Like you, you have these habits and you have this, this way of sort of seeing things that isn't, um, that isn't really all that helpful is basically what he's trying to say. And so in verse two, he says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. So basically he's saying you're acting like babies. And then in verse three, he says, you are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service." You are God's field, God's building. So what is he saying here? He's building this argument that, like, look, if you limit your perspective to the things that you prefer, and you are, and you begin to die, like to tune out and disregard the voices that didn't bring you into the room or that didn't really grab you the first time you heard them, then what, are, what kinds of things are you going to be missing? You're going to miss out on all of the beautiful things that happen when they are the ones who are leading the conversation. 
So now you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the binary point of view, the sacred versus the non-sacred. The idea that if you're in one building, that's a sacred space. But then if you go, like if you're here in this building, this is the sacred space, but the jujitsu studio across the parking lot, that is a non-sacred space. And so we have like this binary way of, of, of seeing all of reality of, well, there are certain places that are sacred and certain things that are not, or certain places that are not. And basically Paul is confronting this mentality, but he's, uh, he's applying it to everything. And he's saying, it's not just that one space is sacred and the other isn't, and that all, all space is sacred which is true, he's saying we also have this mentality when we encounter other people, that when we listen to one person over another, we assume, oh, when this person talks, like this person has all the wisdom and all the insight, but when this other person talks, I like, I like the jokes that the other one tells, and so that's the one I'm going to be more engaged with or, or whatever. And so, so Paul starts talking about, so he's kind of dialing in to this point of view, this argument of like, yeah, we got to get past this binary sacred versus non-sacred idea. Like the whole thing is sacred. And so Paul is basically saying to this room or to this group of people in Corinth, he's saying, you all have decided which of these teachers is most capable of, con of conveying some kind of sacred truth, which means, like, the implication being the other people that you're not listening to are not engaging, in your mind, the sacred. So he's saying we, we still are dealing with the binary. We are still trying to get over this way of, like, this black and white way of seeing all things. So this goes, and by the way, this goes way beyond personal preference or style or personality type. Because Paul is getting at the question, he's going way past like, who do you prefer to listen to? And he's digging directly into the, the actual point of the discussion, which is where, where exactly do we believe truth comes from? What is the source of truth? This is the question that Paul is trying to raise. So Paul is acknowledging people's tendency towards the binary. And he says, that this is not how any of, thing, of this works. If we have this binary way of living, then we will only experience truth when it, happens to ha when it happens to occur in the places that we have already decided that truth can come from. So I would argue that Paul is saying, perhaps one of the reasons that you are struggling to experience wonder is because you have such a narrow definition of where wonder and truth are even allowed to come from. And so, and, and so he goes through all, by the way, so he begins to sort of build and go through these arguments, like through the beginning in verse 10, all the way down to verse 21. And so then he starts to wrap it up in verse 21, and he says this. He says, so then, so then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. What is he talking about? Like, why? Like, if you're having this conversation about, like, well, I like this one and I like this one, and you're like, whoa, 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 all things are yours. What is he even talking about? What does he mean when he says all things are yours? So, in Greek, we, so we have this phrase, and this is sort of where we're kind of revolving around. All things are yours. Now, in Greek, here's the interesting thing. In Greek, this phrase, all things, literally translates to all things. It's actually perfectly accurate. So um, you thought I was going to like say something that was different and mind-blowing, but it's not. It's all things. It literally means all things. So what's he saying? When he says all things are yours, what does he mean when he says all things? He means, he means all things. He means when, when we're dealing with something that's true and real, that somehow, in some sort of divine, mysterious way, somehow that belongs to you. If something, so in other words, what he's saying is, listen, if you encounter something that's true, claim it because it's yours, and it doesn't matter who said it. If it's true, it belongs to you. So then in verse 22, right after, so he says, all things are yours, and then he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, so he starts off by, by talking about teachers, right? So he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, all things are yours. So again, he's kind of digging back into the original point of discussion. All things are yours, no matter who says it. This is why it's important, by the way, that more than one gender be represented in leadership in any church that hopes to be healthy in this world. Because in, I, I've, I've worked in churches where you would never hear a woman preach or lead in any sort of way. And so when Caroline and I uh, started leading a church in 2014, one of the first decisions we made was, listen, if I'm not the one preaching, and I'm realizing like I'm, I'm, it's my job to be there most of the time, so I'm gonna go, so obviously I'm not gonna shirk that responsibility, but at the same time, if I'm not gonna be here, I'm gonna do as much as I can to make sure when I'm not the one talking, it will not be somebody who is a white man. Because it's possible that most of the people who are attending this church have, have been in churches for 40, 50, 60 years, and they have only ever heard from white men. 
and they've definitely never heard from a woman. And so, and that turned out to be true. So we ended up, um, we ended up bringing in several, like really like powerful, brilliant female speakers. And like, I heard from people who were in their 60s and 70s saying, I've been in church forever. That's the first time I've ever heard a woman preach a sermon. Like how in the world is that even possible? Oh, it's because we, we have set up, the, we have established this tradition that says only certain voices are allowed in the room or allowed at least to have like influence or weight in the room. But what are we doing when we do that? Well, we're saying that only half the population has anything interesting or worthwhile to say. And I think Paul is saying like, whoa, if you do that, there's all sorts of wonder and beauty and insight that you are leaving on the table. Like you, you have got to start claiming more things that are true because all things are yours. If you exclude more than half the population from being able to lead or to speak, you are missing out on all kinds of beauty and wonder and insight. So, so Paul starts off by talking about like, look, all things are yours. No matter who's, no matter whose preaching style you prefer, all things are yours. If it's true, it's yours. Claim it. But then he decides to build it out a little bit. So he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or then, and then he says, or the world. So like in case we were thinking a little too small, let's just go ahead and expand it a little bit and say, well, it might be about teachers or it might be about, you know, the world. And so he, it gets so much bigger than just like, who do you prefer to listen to? It becomes about everything. It becomes about all of creation. It becomes all about all of existence. There's a writer named Arthur Holmes who coined the phrase, all truth is God's truth. What does this mean? It means if you encounter something out in the world and it's true, you don't have to be scared of it because it's yours. All things are yours. How many of us know people who, regardless of scientific discovery or fact or evidence, they will say, well, no, that doesn't agree with the Bible, so I can't believe it. Okay, so, so maybe if our perspective is, I have to reject this thing, regardless of how true it happens to be, I still have to reject it because my faith will crumble if I end up believing that the earth is round or that, that certain, like, that medicine is a good thing or, or any number of, of things that people tend to reject regardless of what, like, science or archaeology or history tells us. And so what does that, like, what does that do to us? Oh, it, it, it shuts us off. It, it makes things smaller. And so Paul is basically saying, no, all truth is God's truth. He's saying, all things are yours. If anything, if you, if you are out in the world around you and you encounter something that's true, it doesn't have to scare you. Claim it. It's yours. You don't have to be afraid of it. Paul is saying, you don't have to fear anything if it's true. And so, um, in fact, I was, um, when I was in seminary, I, I was at, uh, I, I was in seminary in Waco at Baylor. And um, there was, I was attending a lecture that was meant for undergrads, but I snuck in. And so I, um, and the, the speaker was a guy named Peter Rollins. And Peter Rollins is an Irish philosopher slash theologian. And I love Peter Rollins. And so he was giving this lecture, and there was a Q&A time afterwards. And um, this undergrad raises his hand, and he says, okay, I've got a question for you. He says, um, he says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What do you make of that? And Rollins perfectly answers this question in a, in a beautiful Irish accent that I will not do for you. But he says, he says, I'm so glad you asked. I love that question. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, what Jesus is saying is, anytime you encounter something that's true, you have somehow encountered the divine, whether you know it or not. What Jesus is saying there is, the whole thing is so much bigger than you think it is. It isn't just narrowed down to the pre-approved things that you've been told. It is any time you encounter something that's true, that's yours. Claim it. Because that is, you have somehow encountered the divine. And so there is this, like, so any time we make discovery, any time we learn something new about reality, I would argue that as Jesus saying, see what I did there? You know what I mean? So like there is this whole, there is this whole big, beautiful thing going on. And if we start rejecting everything that doesn't come from the pre-approved sources, what are we missing out on? So, so Paul says this whole thing about whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, and then he continues to expand it and says, or life or death, which you know, that covers quite a bit of ground. So, so if you observe, so in other words, if you observe something true about what it means to be human or alive or something true about mortality and death, and it didn't come from a place that you were told it was allowed to come from, but you, you hear it and you think, oh, actually, that's quite profound and that's true. You don't have to be afraid of it. Paul is saying, oh, that, that's yours. Like, claim it. You have encountered something divine. 
because you are of Christ and Christ is of God and all things are yours. And so then, and so he says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or, and he says, or the present or the future, which again, I think we've covered just about all of it. You know, I, I don't know that he left much on the table after that. So the present or the future, basically anything that occurred in physical space or in time, if it's true, it's yours. And so then in verse 23, he wraps it up and he says, and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. So what's the argument he's making? He's saying, listen, I don't care where it came from. If you find something, if you, if you are living your life and you encounter something and it strikes you as, oh, that's a true thing. That is a thing that is true. That is a part of reality. You don't have to be afraid of it. Paul is saying, because you are of Christ and Christ is of God, so all things are yours. All truth is God's truth and you can claim it, whether or not it came from the person or the source that you prefer. Paul seems to think the whole thing is pointing towards something much larger. And if something is true, you are allowed to claim it because you are of Christ and Christ is of God and all things are yours. Look at, uh, let's jump back a, a, a book. In, uh, there's a different letter that Paul writes uh, to a group of people in Rome. It's called Romans. These titles are great. So in Romans, um, in this letter to the Romans in chapter two, Paul writes this. And by the way, he's writing to a group of people. He's writing to kind of a mixed group. And there are certain people in the room who are Jewish and were raised Jewish and have like deep roots in Jewish tradition. And there are some people who are Roman citizens who have no concept of Jewish tradition or history or, or uh, teachings. And so he's writing to this group of people who are very mixed. And so this is what he says to this group of people. In verse 14, he says, indeed, when Gentiles, which is another way of saying non-Jewish people, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, which by the way is enough to get you, I mean, a harshly worded email would not be uh, surprising if, if somebody said something like this in a particular context. So basically this would have been a deeply subversive and controversial thing for Paul to say to all of his Jewish hearers. So he's saying, look, it's possible that somebody wasn't raised in the same tradition or language or like base of scripture that we were given, and somehow they still kind of get it. And then in verse 15, it says, they, the people who have the law written on their, or it says, uh, the people who did not grow up with the law. In verse 15, it says, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bear witness, and their thoughts, sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. What is he getting at? Paul is saying, there are people, there are people all around you who do not have this shared language that we have, that we've built together, and they don't have the same tradition, and they don't have the same teachings necessarily that we've all grown up with, but somehow there is still something woven inside of them, and they get it even though no one had to tell them all the things and they're not using the same exact language that we're used to using, but somehow they still seem dialed in to what we're doing here, to, to the story that we're all a part of. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever encountered someone who does not hold any of the same beliefs that you hold? They don't vote the same way. They don't have the same like religious tradition as you. They don't use any of the same kind of language when they talk about like faith or reality, or any of those kinds of things. They have no, like you have nothing in common in terms of like core beliefs, as far as you can tell. And somehow, they love their kids anyway. You know what I mean? Like, who taught them to do that? Did they have to go to a church service or a seminar or read a book to to, to learn that? Oh, it's actually a good thing to be like nice to your kids, and and to encourage them and to treat them well. Like, no, no one had to tell them that. Why? Because at some point, they are, there is something written on their hearts. They, there is something woven inside of them that it like goes deep into their bones at a cellular level. They understand, oh, it, it is the right thing to do to love your kids. And so where did that come from? Who told them that? If they didn't, if they, if they didn't go to a Bible study where they heard that, where did they find out? Where, like, who, how, how, did, how did word get out? Well, they just, they just know. It's, it's written on their hearts. Something is woven into them and they get it. There is, there is something, I would argue Paul is saying, oh yeah, there is something divine there, regardless of what kind of language they use to describe their overall like history, belief system, their shared language, whatever. Like, yeah, there's like loving your kids is a good thing, regardless of who does it. So if it's true, it's yours. You can claim it regardless of where it came from. I would, um, most major world religions would agree that it's good to take care of the poor. If a Christian is actively doing things that are helpful to people who have less, we would affirm that, right? 
But if a Buddhist is doing it, will we also affirm it? Will we also say, well, that's that, like it's still true to care for the poor, regardless of whether or not I understand or agree with or affirm that whole like the whole structure of that religious faith. Probably you would say like, yeah, I don't have to agree with everything that this person says to say like, well, what like helping a person who is in need is still a good thing, regardless of what their tradition is. Right. And so Paul is saying like, yeah, you don't have to agree with everything to acknowledge truth when you find it and to say like, oh, if it's true, it's yours. Claim it. Something is woven into that person's heart, whether they know it or not. So let's celebrate that instead of just rejecting it wholeheartedly because they don't have the same language that we have. And so, um, in fact, look at the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, you have this ancient Jewish prophet who says this. says, and they were, um, in, uh, yeah, in chapter 6, verse 3, says, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Not the whole church, not the whole temple. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. Now, this word glory could be weight or significance. Another way to say it would be reality. The whole earth is filled with God's reality. Anytime you encounter something and you can look at that and you say, that's good, it's true, then it belongs to you. Claim it. All truth is God's truth, no matter where you encounter it. The whole earth is filled with God's truth. A lot of us have been handed a very narrow set of parameters about where truth is and is not allowed to come from. Are you with me? Like, how far would you have to drive to get to a Christian bookstore right now? Are you with me? So, like, there is, there, we, have, we have our own bookstores. We have our own music. We have our own breath mints. We have our own auto mechanics. Like, we have, we have all the things that say, listen, if I want to exist inside of a bubble that only has, like, this particular term attached to it, this, this label that I've agreed to, and all I do is encounter things that share the same label as me, then how much wonder and beauty am I missing? And by the way, this is not the same as saying all, um, when, when Paul says all things are yours, he's not saying all things are true. There are things in this world that we, when we encounter them, we think that's wrong. That's, that is, you, I mean, I would even argue, I would go further than that. I would say there are certain things that when you encounter them, you would say, this is evil, this is dark, this is broken. Like there are certain things around us that when we encounter them, we would have to reject. And then we would have to say, like, I'm sorry, I cannot go there with you. That is, um, I, I cannot affirm that this is true. That is fully part of this as well. But when, what Paul is saying here is he's saying, look, yeah, there's lots of stuff to disagree with, and there's lots of stuff to reject, but there's also lots of stuff to claim, so, because any time you encounter something that's true, you are somehow mysteriously encountering the divine. Jesus is in that space, whether you know it or not. Or, as Jacob might say, surely God was in this place, and I was not aware of it. So look at um, the book of Acts, chapter 17. So again, we have Paul. We have the story of Paul, and he's going to Athens, Greece, and he's talking to this group of people. In, in, in Greece, you have a massive religious structure that's built around lots and lots of gods, like dozens and dozens of different gods that all serve different kinds of purposes. And so Paul goes into this space where there are statues and monuments to these different gods surrounding him. And so he's talking to this group of people in a, like a giant space filled with, with statues and altars for other gods. And so this is what Paul says in verse 22. This cracks me up. He says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the, Agra Ara uh, I'm sorry, of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, which is hilarious. He is standing in a room full of, of statues of different gods. And he's looking around. He's like, you know what? I get a feeling you guys are a little bit religious. And they're like, how did you know? So, um, so he's standing there amidst all of these different statues to these different gods. And, this is, and so he begins to sort of build out kind of what he's trying to say. And he begins to talk about like the beauty and reality of the entire world. And so and then in verse 26, he says, from one man, he, God, made all the nations, and they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this, did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. So he's talking about like the reality of all things. But notice here, if, you, if you're looking at this, there are like these many quotation marks inside the quotation marks. Ask yourself why that is, and we'll get back to that in a second. So then he says, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And then you have another set of like many quotation marks inside the quotation. Why is that? So when Paul says, some of your own poets have said we are his offspring, what's he doing? 
he's quoting Greek poets. Now, here's a question for you. If you're going to quote a Greek poet, what do you have to do first? You have to read the Greek poet. So Paul here, and the reason you see it twice is because Paul's quoting two different Greek poets. Paul is not Greek. Paul it was raised Roman. He's a, he, he is Jewish by tradition. And so he has no, there's no good reason for him to understand Greek poetry unless he went out of his way to start trying to understand it. So Paul has been reading Greek poetry and philosophy. And so Paul, what's Paul doing here? He's reading something that does not directly agree with his entire tradition, but he's reading something. He finds something that he, he, he's able to say, oh, I understand this language. This is true. So he claims it because all things are yours, because you are of Christ and Christ is of God. So Paul finds truth wherever he can get his hands on it, and then he claims it, whether it comes from a Greek poet or not. If, the, if Paul never read Greek poetry, there would literally be verses in the Bible that aren't there. We need to begin to ask new questions about what kinds of, what kinds of things are we looking to to experience wonder. At the previous church that I mentioned before, I was preaching a sermon one day. It's about the angriest I ever made somebody, which is really saying something. But I, um, after, before today, who knows how this is going to go. But I, um, so I was preaching this sermon, and, um, and, and so I, in the sermon, I started quoting from an article uh, that I had read in Rolling Stone magazine. And in the article, it was, an, it was actually an interview with an author by the name of Chuck Palahniuk. If you don't know who Chuck Palahniuk is, he wrote a novel called Fight Club. I would not recommend kids that you go read Fight Club, but um, but anyway, so uh, Polinek has written this book, Fight Club, and he's being interviewed about sort of like his experience and kind of the research that went into him writing the book. And he talks about in the interview, he he says one of the things that I did, I went, I started going to support groups for people who were dying of a terminal illness, who knew that they were going to die soon. And he said, I started going to these, and if you if you are if you're familiar with Fight Club, you're like, oh okay, I understand like where that came from, and so. Um, not that I would have read or seen Fight Club, I'm just saying. But I, um, so anyway, so in, so he, he's doing this, he's doing this research and he goes to these support groups and he says, and as I was going to these support groups, I began to make an observation. And he said, I realize this is a space, like when I am in the space, I am around people who are more honest and vulnerable and accepting of each other than any other place I have ever been. Because this group of people has nothing to lose from being open and honest with each other. And then Polinick says this. He said, I've always imagined that's what church was supposed to feel like. Chuck Polinick is not a Christian. As far as I know, I don't even know. I, I'm not 100% sure exactly what he believes, but it isn't this. And so how in the world did he come to that conclusion? And so I'm reading this, and I have this thought of, oh, that is a beautiful way to sort of confront us and how we build church. And like the, the like things like when we come to church and are, have a lot of pretense and, and kind of put on a false show and are more worried about our appearance than how other people are doing. And so I, so I read that quote in a service. The next day, I got a very long email from a very upset woman who, and the thing that she was upset about was not that the quote was untrue. It was what I was quoting from. She said, how dare you quote from Rolling Stone magazine in a church? Because this space is sacred. I can do it in the jujitsu studio, but not here. You know what I mean? And so she, like a five paragraph essay on how all, like how wrong I was to quote from Rolling Stone magazine. And again, like not a, not a word on like whether or not the thing that was said was true. It was, where did the thing come from? Right? Because we have this, this like almost like negative reaction to anything that comes from someplace that we didn't want it to come from. And so, but again, what if Paul had taken exactly the same attitude regarding Greek poets? Oh, yeah, there'd be a couple of verses from Acts that aren't there. Yeah. So what does it look like? So what happens when we narrow our focus and our attention and our interest to the things that we've already been told are safe and already been told are, like, the, the, this source has been pre-approved for you. Like, I've already, I've already like, gone through and, like, audit, like, edited all the stuff that I don't want you to, to think about, and then now you can read this, or now you can look at this. You know what I mean? And again, it's not saying like that they're like everything is worth reading or looking at. It's just it's the thing of like if I reject something simply because of who said it, what kinds of things am I not experiencing? What kind of truth am I missing? What kind of wonder am I not encountering? And so and by the way, this this has a lot to say about how we consume art, specifically art that is or is not labeled Christian. Um, it is possible. It is possible to have the Christian label and for something to not be true. 
it is also possible for something to not be labeled Christian and to be deeply true and profound. As it turns out, when we start talking about Christian books, Christian movies, Christian like whatever, we're not talking about reality. We're not, ta we're not talking about a belief structure. We're not even talking about a shared vocabulary. We're talking about a marketing term. Because a lot of times this word is not used to point to something good or true. It's used to sell things to people who will only buy things that have that label on them. And so what Paul is getting at is, like, do you really want your world to be so small that it only, it only contains things that already have the marketing term that you, all, that you have agreed on? Like, is, is that how small you want things to be? Because it turns out the whole thing's much bigger, because all things are yours. It's possible for the word Christian to be reduced to something we use to sell T-shirts and breath mats. This basically, and again, like if you, if, if those are the things that you prefer just because your preference points towards that, fine. I'm not, I'm not at all, I'm not indicting your taste, although we could have a whole conversation about like whether or not Christian art is good most of the time or not. That's a whole other conversation. That's between you and the Lord. But I, um, but the, the bigger point is, am I, am I not looking for, for wisdom or beauty or wonder in spaces that haven't been pre-approved for me? Um, so, in fact, let's take a look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. More Paul. We are all over. Paul, Paul is all over the place today. So, um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes this. He's in verse 20. He says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. There's other translations that say test everything. Hold on to what is good reject every kind of evil. What is he saying? He's saying, yeah, you will live your life. If you, are, if you are existing on this planet and you are living not inside a bubble, you are going to every single day encounter things and you're going to have to start asking questions about how am I supposed to receive this? And so Paul says, test everything. He says, yeah, sometimes you're going to encounter something and it's evil or it's dark or it's untrue. And he says, reject, feel free to reject those things. But also you're going to encounter things that are true in places that you didn't expect to. And rather than just reject those things because they came from someone that you weren't expecting it to or it came out of a book or a magazine that you were told by your pastor you shouldn't be reading, then like, how small do you want your world to be? Because all things are yours. There's wonder everywhere. When you encounter anything, ask yourself, is this true? Is it good? Is it, does it bring more joy or love or grace or wisdom into the world? And if it does, claim it, celebrate it because it's yours, because you are of Christ and Christ is of God. All truth is God's truth. I, um, I, I met somebody, and I, uh, so a while back, I, I, I knew somebody who was going through kind of some mental health struggles, and, um, and he called me, and he said, hey, um, I, I'm, I'm looking for a therapist. Do you have anybody to recommend? And I gave him some names, and he said, oh, um, actually, I need to ask you, are any of the names on your list Christian counselors? Because my pastor told me I should only go see a Christian counselor. And so I kind of pushed back on that a little bit because in, in sort of my, my perspective on that was like, look, if your appendix were about to burst and they were about to put you under, would you be like, whoa, 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 is the doctor a Christian doctor? Or would you be like, did the doctor go to medical school? You know what I mean? Like, let's, let's, uh, let's prioritize what matters most right here in this exact moment. And so to, to say that only a Christian counselor t can help somebody is like saying only a doctor who's a Christian can help somebody even if he didn't go to medical school, right? So there is, and, and again, nothing against people who are Christian counselors or people who have gained insight and wisdom from Christian counselors. But again, to limit your scope to like, well, I'll only go to people, I will only get advice from people who are Christians is, a, is, is like saying like my world is quite small because as it turns out, it's much bigger because all things are yours. All truth is God's truth. All space is sacred. Paul wants you to test everything and to claim it and to celebrate truth wherever you find it. When you go looking for wonder, you're probably, gonna, you're probably going to find it in some pretty unexpected places. It is possible that when you are encountering perspectives, arguments, ideas, or points of view, it is possible that at any point you might find yourself saying, oh, Surely God was in this place, and I was not aware of it. So may you go looking for wonder and truth all over the place. May you find that any time you find something that is true or good or beautiful, you can claim it because it's yours, because you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for this invitation to go looking for beauty and wonder all kinds of new and unexpected places. May we be open to the possibility that there are things that we can learn beyond 
the bubbles that we've been told that we can stay inside of. May we be curious. May we walk around with our eyes open. May we encounter beautiful things and say to ourselves, surely God was in this place and I was not aware of it. In the name of Jesus, we pray.